Well, I took my first degree in political science and I was interested in motivation for social conflict primarily. And at the time I took my degree, and I suppose it's probably similar now, all the explanations for social conflict were economic. You know, people are basically fighting over resources of one form or another. And that, that just struck me as wrong. It's too simple. And, and it also doesn't explain why people value certain resources. It's not self-evident that a resource has value. It depends very much on the cultural context. And it did, also didn't seem to me to take into account the relationship between belief and the individual. You know, it was a purely economic explanation. And plus then it's also predicated on an essentially economic view of man. It wasn't deep enough to really explain the issue. And, and at that time too, it was in the early 80s when I really started to think about this. It was sort of the second peak of the Cold War and, and people were very, very worried about nuclear destruction. You know, it was, it was a constant background concern. And so part of what I was curious about was what, how belief could be important enough so that people would be willing to put life itself at risk to have produced this insane standoff with these tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. And then there was something beyond that too, because you can explain some of that with just, just with territoriality. But there was more, there was an element of gratuitous violence that characterized situations like those in Nazi Germany and also in the Stalinist camps and in lots of other places as well, but those were the two that really stood out for me that I felt couldn't be explained by, well, certainly not by a resource theory or even really by a theory that had anything to do with territoriality. There was some other element that was more metaphysical that wasn't being attended to. You just couldn't account for those sorts of things. You know, it's one thing to kill people. You can even make a rational account for that in, under many circumstances, but to make them as miserable as possible while you're killing them, and then also to do it in a manner that's counterproductive with regards to your own ends, because that clearly happened in Nazi Germany. That's not, there's no straightforward rational explanation for that. So I started reading more and more about that. There was something about, especially the archetypes of the collective unconscious, reading that in relationship to the Gulag Archipelago, that I felt that there was something there that really bore further investigation. You know, and Solzhenitsyn, for example, he concentrated a lot on the relationship between individual deceit, particularly lying, to put it simply, and the pathologies of the state makes a very clear case for that. And I'd always sort of interpreted Freud's idea of repression as a form of lie. Now, I don't think his account of repression is, is correct, but it doesn't matter. It's interestingly wrong at least, or it's approximately right, something like that. And then there was a weird connection between this idea of the lie as the root of pathology in totalitarian states and archetypal religious ideas of, that were associated with the idea of good and evil. And so that started to attract my attention. I was probably about 20. It was 1982. Yeah, I was 20. And I was also reading Nietzsche at the time, and I read everything that he wrote that, that of his major works. I mean, the whole collected works hadn't been published yet, but I read him in chronological order. And that was extremely interesting for me as well. And there's, there's a very interesting intellectual relationship between Nietzsche and Jung and Solzhenitsyn. You know, and the Solzhenitsyn connection is more through Dostoevsky. You know, and Dostoevsky and Jung or and Nietzsche were investigating very, very similar ideas at exactly the same time. So there's these weird parallelisms of thought. And although people don't know it well, Jung was extremely influenced by Nietzsche just as much as by Freud. I mean, he, he, there, are, there is a publication, for example, that's notes on his uh, seminar on Z Thus Spake Zarathustra, and it's like 2,600 pages long, and it only covers the first third of, the, of Thus Spake Zarathustra. So Jung was very interested in Nietzsche. So these, I found this source of ideas, which I suppose was grounded in some sense in 19th century romanticism, that seemed to really get at the root of the question as far as I was concerned. So, because there's something, there's something that isn't just 
It's not just rational behavior that drives people towards war. There's an irrational element of it that you can't explain without, I don't think you can explain it at all without recourse to religious language. It's the only language that's deep enough to get at it properly. So, I started reading all this, like I didn't understand the archetypes of the collective unconscious at all. So I read it again, and then I read it again, and then I, then I started to understand what, what he was talking about a little bit, you know. The, the idea that, these, that there were patterns of action and perception, in a sense, or, or cognitive categories, that's another way of looking at it, that, that lie at the bottom of our thoughts. They structure the way that we look at the world. And they have deep evolutionary, a deep evolutionary basis. And they have the quality in a sense of gods. And that really, that, that really frightened me, that idea. You know, one thing Jung said, which I really love, he said, uh, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. I thought, oh yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. It's like Richard Dawkins' idea of meme. It's funny to read Dawkins, because Dawkins is someone who is almost to the point where he could read Jung. Because his idea of memes and the archetypes are very, very close, except the meme is a trivial concept compared to the archetype. So, an archetype is like a meta-meme in a sense. It's deep, it's so ancient that it, it's tangled up in our biology. So, uh, Dawkins, even though he's an evolutionary thinker, is still like a post-enlightenment rationalist. You actually can't be a post-enlightenment rationalist and an evolutionary thinker. That doesn't work. Well, you're too concerned with rationality. Rationality is new. It hardly even matters in some sense. So, anyway, so I, I was obsessed with the, with the idea of destruction and the will to destroy fundamentally, and its expression in totalitarianism, and then its relationship with the history of ideas in general. That's partly why I found Nietzsche so useful, because Nietzsche predicted that the 20th century would be a war in some sense between, well, certainly a war that was, that would involve communist ideas. He, he predicted that in about 1860, something like that, in Will to Power. He said that, you know, we'll pay for that conflict with couple of tens of millions of lives, which is quite the prognostication, like 30 years before the fact. And then he also talked about nihilism and, and both of those as a reaction to the collapse of Christianity. And that struck me as highly plausible. So, so Nietzsche was also extremely useful. See, one of the things about Jung is that Jung spent his whole career trying to answer Nietzsche's question. So Nietzsche said basically that the conflict between enlightenment thinking and religious thinking, Christian thinking in particular, was going to wipe Christian thinking out, or at least people's ability to believe in the metaphysical assumptions that underlied Christianity. And that the only proper response to that would be nihilism, which he was very much concerned with, or authoritarianism. And so Nietzsche was trying to develop a philosophy of what might constitute a third path. And that's expressed to some degree in Thus Spake Zarathustra with the idea of the superman or the overman. But that idea really never got developed. In fact, Jung believed that the development of that idea was part of what drove Nietzsche insane. He, he thought that he developed a kind of schizophrenic inflation Jung b believed that inflation was the invasion of the conscious ego with archetypal content. And so it's almost like when the old hero dies, a new hero is born. And that new hero in some sense was born within Nietzsche's consciousness. But those are experiences that are powerful enough in some sense to have a psychotic element to them. And anyways, Nietzsche died before he developed those ideas very far, but then Jung spent his entire career, in some sense, trying to understand hero mythology fundamentally.